Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are here today. Um, my name is Alicia O'Brien. I'm the Director of Marketing at Crank Software, and we are joining with NXP today to have a webinar about how to optimize your embedded UI for mass production. So just a couple of housekeeping notes in terms of interacting with our speakers today. Uh, if you'd like to participate, you can open and close your GoToWebinar panel on the right-hand side of your screen with that little arrow. Um, at any time, if you want to select or test your audio, um, use the audio arrow there, uh, just open it and expand it. And if you'd like to submit some questions, which we'll be addressing towards the end of the session, uh, just send us a message in the chat function here on the right-hand side. We're also going to be tweeting this live um, on Twitter with the hashtag embedded GUI. So please do interact in, uh, with us and, and maybe we'll follow you in return. Uh, like I said, we'll be doing Q&A at the end of this session. So please do address them in the questions box. Okay, so just in terms of uh, follow up from this webinar, just a, a calendar note in that please put in your calendar for May 23rd. We'll be following this up with another webinar uh, run with our partner NXP, and it's going to be about building your next supercharged embedded UI on the RT1060. So make sure to follow up uh, to look for the, the the URL to register for this. We'll be popping it in the chat in a minute. Um, you'll also should have received it in your original emails from us or NXP. Okay, so over to our uh, speakers today. I'd like to introduce Jason Clark, who is our VP of Sales and Marketing here at Crank Software. Mario Centeno, he is the Global Market Manager of NXP. Brendan Slade, who is the Director of MCU Tools and Ecosystem of NXP. And our Gary Clarkson, who is our field application engineer of Crank Software. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jason. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. I'm Jason Clark. So as Alicia mentioned, I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing, but I'm also one of the co-founders here at Crank Software. And today I'm taking a different role in trying to be a, a moderator versus just a uh, speaking head the whole time and drive this conversation. So we have been seeing a lot of interesting things in the market lately. and um, it's been, I'm sorry, it's been causing us to understand that there's a bit of a shift going on as far as where products are and how it is. The embedded market, as we all know, is always evolving and always changing. So this is not unusual, but you know, we're seeing a big jump right now in what's available. And some of the products that Mario and Brendan have are, are very unique. Uh, they're aligned with some of the other great products that are coming out, but uh, they're really changing how people are delivering these, especially when you're getting to high volume products. So just to step back for one second, because I know not all of you are familiar with Crank Software, I am going to give you the one minute overview of who Crank Software is. Um, we are a UI development design tool. Uh, we develop a product called Storyboard. Storyboard makes it really easy to bring together your design and engineering team. So we do a lot of unique things like import Photoshop files, but also re-import them. Uh, do compare and merge at the graphical level, allow the designers to actually stay engaged throughout the product lifecycle so that they can um, control things like animation, tweens, rapidly va validate and prototype different options inside of their product. So that's kind of where we come from. We also provide a lot of different services and everything around this also. I don't want to make it about that today though, because you know we have lots of webinars for that. And in our next webinar, we'll show you a little bit more about how that all comes together. So today we really wanted to focus on, you know, how is this world of UI is changing at a high level and how are some of these new disruptive products in the market helping our end customers deal with this? So, um, as I said, we are a UI company, so we're really seeing this at our end, um, you know, and this is why we brought in the NXP guys, because products like the RT products are causing a bit of a disruption, um, especially, you know, people aren't familiar what what they can do with an MCU these days. Um, they don't realize this isn't the MCU they're used to 10 years ago, that, you know, it could just control a couple of hard buttons and the UIs and what's capable down there. But then there's a whole ecosystem above that. So maybe we'll start the conversation right away. And, you know, maybe I'll throw it over to Mario and ask Mario from NXP standpoint, how are they seeing this market evolving and what pressures and changes are happening in there? So, um, Mario? Yep, okay. 
Thanks, Clark. So, Alicia, um, let me uh, share my desktop for a second. First of all, uh, thanks uh, to the Crank the, uh, team for um, organizing this and inviting us to participate in this. Um, I'm going to share my desktop here. Uh, this is a, a topic that we wanted to uh, talk about for some time. And, and one of the things that we wanted to do is spend a little bit of time talking about the, the RT series. So we have a little poll here that Alicia is going to kick off and talk about what or ask you if you are familiar with the RT series. And um, one of the things that uh, we've been doing and, and the, the MCU market has been very, you know, traditional over the last uh, several years. And we wanted to figure out how to disrupt the, the market. And, and really what we try to do with the RT series is uh, come up with a product that that really meets the needs of uh, what customers are, are asking for in the market. You know, it's a high performance MCU and, and we have a, a huge customer base in the NXP side that ranges from our MCUs all the way up to our apps processors. And um, we were hearing a lot of feedback from our MCU customers that they really wanted more performance out of a product. And from our application processor side, we were hearing, you know, the customers really wanted to uh, reduce cost uh, out of their systems. And, and that's where we had this idea of this um, crossover um, processors. And, and really what it is, it's a bridge between those uh, MCU customers and those application processor customers. That's what the RT series is all about. It's about performance. And, and not only that, it's about having disruptive uh, price points. And um, one of the triggers to this um, webinar that, that we have today is you know, uh, ourselves and the crank team, we've been seeing a lot, a shift in the market where, you know, consumers are being asked to, or the consumers are being demanding, right? That they're, they're wanting a, a richer UI experience um, and, and really driven by, by the mobile phone. And not only that, um, companies are, are having to, you know, um, meet those needs and, and bring out uh, products at a much faster uh, pace. And, and really that's what we're trying to solve with the RT series is disrupt the market, allow consumers to build or customers to build really nice uh, products with the great UIs and bring them to market uh, faster. Well, Mario, you'd be happy to know that 67% of the people who responded said they, they're aware of the RT series, so. <laughs> that's great, that's great, great to hear. Do you want me to keep going? Um, um, well, I, we can uh, just jump back for a second to the market. So, yeah, yeah. a lot of what Mario is talking about there is we're, we're seeing it on the same side. There, there, is a, there is a shift. And so maybe I'll throw it over to Gary and maybe what you're seeing in the market, Gary, as far as change of uh, from, from the software side, what do you, how are you seeing that the process for what people are picking for their hardware, what they expect from it, and, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the things that are pushing on them as far as getting their products to market? Uh, sure. Um, so a lot of a lot of people I speak to on a daily basis are uh, are moving from a, a micro environment. So uh, they they may have had 10, 15, 20 years of experience with a, an MCU with a, a simple two line LCD display, um, and they're moving to something much more interactive. And so they're they're beginning to add graphics and and text. Uh, and where there's text, there's challenges translation of text. Uh, the images take up more space, so the storage needs to be increased. Um, and so it's 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 kind of a, a there's a, a step up. So people are moving up to more of a uh, a crossover, an application style processor. Uh, and we're also um, seeing lots of customers who uh, have been making high end products for some time, and, uh, and now they're looking to maybe introduce uh, an entry level product with most of the same features, uh, and they're looking to reduce the price point at that point. So. Uh, it's it's really interesting. Um, the uh, the RT series does seem to intersect right across the middle, and um, and we're seeing uh, you know seeing really a quite a lot of interest in in how to just achieve a, a professional, a, a slick, uh, an interactive base UI uh, on on uh, on what is a uh, you know a, a, a processor which is uh, in between a, an application processor and an MCU. Yeah, and so what we're always surprised about every day here at Crank is even though we're a UI company, we're always surprised at the the next customer who comes who didn't have an LCD on their display before, and now today they're saying the next level of their product needs an LCD. And you know, sometimes it's a 
you're like, oh, wow, they're going to put an LCD on there now. And you never even thought of it that way. You know, uh, I remember when I first saw like LCDs on my uh, sprinkler controller, which uh, Brendan showed in a previous chalk talk that he did, you know, and and now I have an LCD controller in my uh, my garage controlling my sprinkler system. So, um, Brendan, did you have anything else to add to what you're seeing as far as pushes in the market or? Yeah, I think. Uh... You know, you gave that example there, and, and Gary also mentioned the move away from segment type display. So I think there's there is a whole range of um, uh, different levels of GUI if you if you like UI. Um, even at the very low end, you can have the uh, LCDs, which is still controlled via a pretty low speed interface because those OLED displays and so on are getting pretty cost effective. But what we also see is customers looking for scalability. So you have somebody who's an appliance, for example, where uh, the the traditional interface is is turning knobs, pressing buttons, um, and they they have their very uh, their entry level value products, which really don't need much more than that. There's, but there may, may still be some expectation of something that looks a lot better, a big step forward for that consumer. But they also want to scale up to their very high end products. So having a platform or a series of uh, um, compatible platforms at the software level or the GUI design level is something they care about a lot because they want that reuse um, and the, the software base, base is a key part of this. The interaction between that UI that can be very simplified at the low end up to a very rich UI at the top end is uh, something they need so they can effectively turn out products. And I, Mario was mentioning to me the other day about how the design cycles of these kind of companies coming down from years to, to six months. So that, that's only possible if you can scale the UI and you can reuse the uh, application software in that kind of way. So that's something we're definitely seeing uh, happening very quickly over the last couple of years. And uh, IMAX RT is enabling quite a lot of that too. Yeah. yeah so if I may add a little to that, um, Jason, um, uh, what, Brent, what Brent mentioned is in the past, we had seen design cycles, you know, in the three to four year type of uh, range. And lately, over the last, you know, um, two years, we've seen them cut down to, we've seen some customers go into production in a year. Some customers bring a product from start to uh, prototype in about four months. So I, I think the, the dynamics in the market are requiring com customers to, or uh, companies to differentiate and move fast. And it's really all driven by the, you know, trying to meet consumers' needs, and and the, uh, the HMI experience is is a big part of that. Yeah, so that's actually a good lead into our next poll, which is, you know, let's throw it out to our audience here and see what what do they feel is the biggest issue that they're facing with their next product. Um, you know, is it performance? You know, is it how fast their CPU can go? Is do they have a set of software that they're uh, sort of stuck with and they need to, whatever platform they're picking, they have to stay with that. Is it cost reductions, um, the resources on the system, flash and memory, or, you know, as what we're talking about today, time to market. So I'm just looking quickly here at our poll results and uh, not surprisingly, um, uh, Oh, yeah, lots of lots of people coming in here. Um, and, you know, some of these things lead together because like resources lead into costs. So it's not, uh, you know, and, you know, it, a lot of these things is always hard to say which one is the most because, you know, <laughs> you're probably all being pushed by your marketing teams and your company to uh, hit all these issues. Um, so, but yeah, I, I, not surprisingly, we're seeing time to market. And this lines up exactly with what we're seeing as the biggest problem it's uh time to market we're seeing 35 percent cost 23 um software support and performance coming in and then resources but i i feel resources and costs could probably be pushed together when i think about this poll question um and and this is lining directly with uh a lot of what we're seeing inside of the market so maybe i'll throw it back to mario and he can talk about a little bit more of the history of what they're seeing uh because there's a there's a question of the RT and what we're seeing a lot of people come to us uh, now all of a sudden they realize there's this higher level MCU but then there's also MPU so we're seeing a, both uh, especially when people are scaling up or scaling down where they're they're really in this uh, conundrum trying to figure out which is the best platform for them to land on and how they should make that decision how that fits into the NXP roadmap so maybe I I can throw that back to Mario to uh, give a little bit more on that one. 
Okay, so I, I think yeah, you can see my screen here, yeah. um, hopefully. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll use this slide to speak to that uh, question, uh, Jason. Um, when we talk to customers, uh, you know, e either they're coming from the MCU world or they're coming from the MPU world, and one of the first uh, discussions we have with them is is about software and where where do they they what is the the type of software um, environment or group that they have within their company? Are they, you know, a Linux or Android based uh, um, team or or have they worked with MCUs in the past? And that that usually drives the discussion on whether you know they're going down the MCU route or the MPU route. But typically, I have a bunch of uh, points here. But on the MCU side, it's you know the applications are typically uh, you know they're they're very cost sensitive. Um, we're really focused on on power and and time to market. Some of the common themes that were um, brought up on the on the poll you just did, and on the MPU side, it's you know about performance and about integration, and and with that comes a, a little bit higher complexity in the design, whether it's you know having to deal with you know um, DDR memories or or uh, power management or you know different uh, PCB type of uh, designs and. What we try to do, as I mentioned with the RT series, kind of bridge that 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 gap. And what we've done with the RT series is we used um, an application processor architecture, but with an MCU core, with a Cortex M7 core. And now what we're, we're what we're seeing with the RT series is that you can get performance that you didn't see in an MCU before. You know, we're running the RT series at 600 megahertz. And we'll talk a little bit later uh, today on, on what we see in the future as well for the RT series. And, and we have ideas of even going even more in performance. And what that means now is that, you know, we can, we can have nicer uh, UIs or graphics um, as well, bring in more integration into the space, right? Um, you know, today we have a PXP on, on the device, which is a 2D accelerator, but in the future we have ideas for even more. Um, um, integration to to enhance uh, HMI as well. Um, maybe I'll have Gary follow up on that a bit too. Uh, you're seeing it from the hardware side. Gary's at uh, our feet on the street, so he's uh, seeing it from mm -hmm. the software side. And um, Gary, how do you, how do you feel like customers are trying to decide between this? Because we're seeing this a lot these days. Where before it was very clear, I found you know, it used to be if you wanted a rich UI, you you pretty much needed a higher level OS, whether it's Linux, Android, uh, could even be some of our other partners like Green Hills, QNX, or Wind River. Um, it didn't really matter, but it was kind of, you had to make that jump up to there. Um, nowadays, the realization of what you can do with these MCUs has really changed. So how do you find that uh, are the people that you're talking to are making these decisions? Well, the, um, just, just on an OS basis, the, the step to Linux, if you've not done Linux before, is, is really big. Um, it's a whole new learning curve. And um, mm -hmm. for some people, that's, that's a big barrier. Um, and, uh, you know, if they're used to uh, an RTOS environment on, uh, on an MCU, they're going to they're gonna respond and be much more productive if they're, they're using something like free RTOS. So uh, we see that, uh, I know, um, NXP bundle free Altos with the the SDKs and uh, you know and it's it's, it's a table part of the uh, MCU Expresso world. So in software terms, um, it's it's a lot simpler and it's a lot easier to approach. Uh, and I'm finding that um, you know the step to add a graphical uh, user interface on top of something which is already in an Altos environment is actually uh, is actually much less than re-architecting uh, and moving to uh, something else like Linux to achieve the same goal. So the the end results are uh, are actually pretty comparable in terms of performance, in terms of um, you know the user experience. Um, so yeah, I, th I think uh, I think it's been it's been a real surprise when um, when people see that this is possible. I think we had um, we were doing some training recently uh, at the NXP uh, event in uh, Chicago and also Minneapolis um, uh, using using the Crunk software. And some of the comments I heard from from the uh, the, the delegates attending were were. The, you know, quite surprised that you can achieve you can achieve the the rich UI that you can on on essentially a, a, an MCU. So uh, I think it's it's definitely an enabler, a real enabler, and you can do things now that you couldn't do before. Yeah, and we're seeing this in a, such a interesting spot, and I imagine, uh, and now I'm not the best person to speak to this because we're on the software side, but the cost, uh, the lower cost piece there too. Um, these high volume products are, um, you know, 
now with these richer UIs, now, before it probably escaped them that, you know, putting a simple LCD on a segment display or something, they did that, but now they can actually do something compelling. Um, we just released an ebook, and one of the interesting quotes was there that uh, companies that are investing in the user experience, um, and this is from a data from Foster, show that they're seeing a five times revenue growth from those who are more or less laggards in the market. So the people are saying, you know, we need to give that richer experience, but how do you do that when you're selling like high volume consumer products at a certain price point? Well, now the products are finally getting to a level where you can give that experience that people are expecting. You know, they're so used to this high level experience with their cell phones and such. There's such an expectation once they touch a piece of glass that it's going to scroll and act just like their iPhone does. Uh, they don't really have the uh, appreciation for the cost uh, that has to go into a, you know, a hundred, uh, hundreds of dollars device versus, you know, a cell phone that's at probably at a thousand dollar price point. Um, maybe I'll push this over to Brandon as we're on to costs. Maybe let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the thoughts when people are picking MCUs and everything like that. Um, you know, what are the concerns that they're seeing and how are they piecing it all together and what else should they be thinking about? So, um, Brendan, maybe if I could pass that to you now. Yeah, I think um, it depends where, which direction these these uh, customers are coming from, right? So they've come from the low end MCU end where they've got a device which has got um, maybe an integrated uh, segment control and it may be not and there's not a lot else there's no con there's no uh, uh, frame um, buffer concept to be worried about here I've got a couple of slides that kind of maybe help frame the conversation just a little so if you um, look at a, a system like this at the top here when you start to add a display you need to start adding a frame buffer um, so you can do that with a dis the frame buffer integrated into the, the display but that's obviously a, a worrying cost too. Um, but beyond that, you've got the typical peripherals available ready to do that kind of thing. But when you start trying to look at the uh, um, implementation of a system which has a, a true, a true um, touchable kind of interface that would originate the thoughts of a, a mobile phone, you need to start moving into a, an MCU that's more enabled with other support for that. Uh, some are coming from the high end, kind of looking at what do I need when I look at uh, a microprocessor system, they're looking at uh, PMIX, which is power management ICs, which I think Mario already mentioned. There's um, much more complicated memory systems for your frame buffer and even for the system memory use, uh, DDR memories and DDR2 and 3 memories. And uh, um, you've got to design a circuit board to match that kind of uh, system, which is difficult and quite often people are then looking at an off-the-shelf module, which is going to be more expensive and not really an option in very high volume. So um, the question is, how do you get to that kind of performance Gary was alluding to that people are seeing with RT? And it comes from integration of uh, some certain key technologies. Uh, there is a, a you know, high performance MCU, and there are high performance in the market seen before in the Cortex M7 that we have. Uh, but there's also integration of things like LCD controllers, so you're not plugging up an external display driver bus with that. Um, it's all inside the IC. Um, you've got um, the interface to SD RAM or SRAM. So you, if, when you need a larger frame buffer to con construct multiple frames for highest performance graphics throughput and a nice uh, smooth display, um, then, then you're going to need those those larger frame buffers. I'm going to come back to it in a minute because I want to ask Gary a couple things about that. But um, so on the bottom right, you see a system that integrates those things. But one of the other key things that's happened uh, in recent years is the introduction of these quad spy flash devices. And um, this, uh, the interface that that NXP introduced here a few years ago, and then others have followed suit, is um, an interface such that uh, a spy flash, a serial flash with four lanes um, appears in the memory map like any other memory would be. Um, so from a software perspective, that's nice and straightforward. And over time, we've made that uh, interface have higher performance. We work closely with our memory uh, partners to, to do that. And um, that means we've 
been able to, to achieve higher and higher performance. But for the customer integrating this, they've now got a device, a memory device that integrates to the uh, with with the microcontroller with very few pins and relatively low complexity on the, the design. You're just having a few uh, reasonably high speed connections to the memory device. So that's not that difficult to do. Um, so you've got a smaller footprint and uh, a simpler design, simpler PCB. And um, also these devices are very cost effective. They u utilize the the fact that the flash market is pushing and pushing to very, very small geometry. So the memory vendors can do these devices very cost effectively. And some of the things the RT family does here is it is really right on the leading edge of implement uh, utilizing that kind of technology with double data rate access and so on. Um, so you can not only use it for the code execution, but also for the um, storage of those large graphic assets that uh, um, we, we touched on earlier. And that's one thing that customers quite often get concerned about. I've got, I've got all these graphic images, they're all huge. Where, where am I gonna put the ball? How am I gonna do this without breaking the bank? And the answer is using these uh, quad spy devices. So um, in short, you can implement a very high performance system in it very cost effectively. And the thing I wanted to come back to is, is for Gary is, um, and if we look at the, um, um the key points about performance this is where the guys like gary get clever in terms of how they balance where uh, screen elements are buffered to get highest performance where do you put things on chip and off chip and you know is it even possible to go go forward without having uh, an off chip frame buffer um, so gary can i throw that question over to you uh, absolutely yeah Th thanks brendan um so, if, uh, at least you'll just hand me the, the uh, slide deck. Oh. <laughs> and I can figure out how to share the screen. You can do it, Gary. I can do it. No, there we go. <laughs> there we go. So, um, so we, what, what's interesting is, um, we obviously need some memory uh, and so as a as a, as a software platform we we do use some ram um so i thought i'd uh, note down a few things that we use it for it's maybe obvious to some but uh, it, it's useful to point this out so we use a, a kind of runtime engine that, that is a, a render engine if you imagine how a renderer works you start with the bottom which is a background layer uh, and overlay subs, um, subsequent images on top. so it's a kind of a stack up and to do that, we need some working memory, uh, some, some, some kind of uh, buffer memory to, to move the pixels around. Um, obviously, in a real application, you've got some back-end application code. Uh, it does whatever the machine or the device does. Uh, and probably the, the key factor is the, the frame buffer. Um, so for every pixel on the screen, we need, uh, we need some memory to hold and, uh, and to manipulate that. Um, and so there's, there's other advanced features like 3D uh, applications, um, you know, uh, screen transitions, uh, spinning, rotating, that sort of stuff. Um, you know, we uh, we have uh, a feature called uh, animations in Storyboard, and that allows you to to really kind of bring a UI to uh, to life uh, by by moving it and some subtle changes as you as you're doing things. Uh, and as uh, as Brendan was saying, the um, the flash is actually really interesting. So um, uh, alongside the application code, we've um, we've got some technology called Storyboard Virtual File System. Which allows us to package and store the images and the fonts, and all of the other uh, we'll call them design assets, the, the, the bits that make up your your dis, your display, um, straight into into Flash, and we can store them compressed or uncompressed. Um, you can stream them directly from QSpy, so uh, you know you don't need to buffer them in the memory. You're straight to the screen, and that makes a huge difference in terms of the amount of memory that we use uh, for minute, minute plating buffers. And also, uh, in, in some applications, there's, uh, there's some custom scripting and kind of uh, UI-specific uh, navigation and, and, and log code. So I hope that, that gives a, a reasonably good overview of what we use RAM for. And uh, this is obviously set alongside the, uh, the, the, the whatever the, the device or the application is already using. And uh, the, uh, the key thing really is, I, I think, the, uh, the first question we always get asked is, um, how much memory do you use? And uh, and that's 
usually specifically down to the size of the display. So this is often a key decision point. Um, so you, you know, for every, as I mentioned before, every every pixel needs somewhere to store it. Um, in an ideal world, we'd like two frame buffers, so we can draw to one where we're um, displaying on the LCD from the other, so you don't see kind of drawing as it's happening. And uh, that's called double buffering. So uh, if you imagine two of these, um, you can quickly see that, uh, that the size of the display chosen and indeed the color depth uh, has a direct impact of uh, some of the, the sizes of memory that you're going to be needing. So this, uh, again, with uh, looking at some of the, the RT family, um, there's, uh, there's onboard RAM up to uh, uh, one megabyte at the moment. Um, the, the 1060 has one meg and the, the uh, 1050 family have, uh, have 512K. Um, we can use those for a reasonable size display and sensible size. And that can be all done on chip. In fact, uh, we've got some applications running entirely on chip memory. So. Um, uh, that's uh, that obviously allows you to to not fit SD RAM. You know, this is reducing again, the, uh, as Brendan has mentioned, the cost and the complexity of the design. So I hope that makes sense in terms of you know how to calculate this. Just look at look at the number of pixels and the color depth, and uh, and it, it's uh, it's an obvious it's an obvious calculation. But uh, but do that before you start choosing screen sizes and, and processors. Mm -hmm. So Gary, I have a question. So you, you talked sure. earlier about the scalability of design. So we say, for example, that 128 by 128 display at the entry level here for a, that low end appliance. So can you take the same design of that UI and then scale up to your top end model, which has a 480 by 320 display and uh, reuse a lot of the, the crank software that's developed for that? Between those two platforms, yeah, absolutely. We've um, we've we've got several tools built into Storyboard. Um, there's a resize tool which intelligently um, scales images and repositions text and everything else. Um, that's that's pretty effective. Um, it's easier scaling uh, in one direction than the other. Um, obviously, you've got to look at the aspect ratios as well. Yeah, so I changed the aspect ratio on you. I didn't intend yeah. to do that. Yeah, and your design yeah. team would never let you just scale it. <laughs> 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 well, you can, but it looks terrible. <laughs> so, I mean, as, uh, as as Jason mentioned earlier, they, they if you start off with with a design with uh, an industrial designer, something like Photoshop, uh, that's the design master. They can then take that design and move the images around and you know scale it in in the in the design world, and then we can re-import that on top of an existing application uh, and literally reskin it. Uh, so that may be. Uh, a resize of a display to, to, to sharpen up the images rather than taking a small image and trying to um, interpolate it into a larger image. So that's a, that's a, a, a very useful and quite a common use case. So uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, you can see there, I think um, up to up to around the 480 by 320, it's quite feasible to run uh, on internal only memory on the, uh, mm -hmm. on the, the 1060. Uh, if you're, you know, you're keeping the application reasonably simple. Obviously, you've got uh, you've got other things, uh, complex fonts and other other animations that may push that boundary a little. But uh, but it is you know it is it is an option now, um, and uh, the you know the amount of memory that's on board these devices is actually really really quite useful. Yeah, and I'm going to totally set Gary up for his next slide here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what we always see uh, from our standpoint is a customer says, like, they're looking at a part like the RT1060, which has one meg of internal RAM, and they want to keep it inside there because they really don't want to have to put an external RAM controller on for, you know, usually costing reasons. Um, but they always come to us and they say something like, we have 200 screens. Um, you know, and we want to be at this resolution and that. So they, they, they need some way to understand how much memory they're using. And so this is a lot of times we have to work with them on prototypes and stuff. But I just wanted to see if uh, Gary can uh, talk to that and uh, and uh, just take the slide and just talk about it. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Jason. <laughs> no. um, here's what you've seen. Um, I, I think we're we're right in showing this now. Uh, this is a new version of Storyboard, which will be released uh, either later this week or beginning next week. Um, we've added some uh, as a direct result of working with NXP and our customers on on the, the applications with the, uh, the RT. Is um, we needed a, a really good way of, of giving them the information as they're, they're progressing through a design. Uh, what you're seeing here is a, a 480 by 272 um, sample called our coffee machine sample. 
And as we're going along, you can see on the right that we've we set up a profile for the board. Um, SBVFS is our kind of in-memory uh, file system. And we're able to, to look at the assets that we've got loaded, the sizes of the images, um, and indeed, you know, give you a, a RAM footprint. Um, in this example, I've configured the images to, to be stored in, in Flash, uh, effectively uh, streamed directly from Flash. So we've, we don't have an intermediate buffer in size memory. Um, and you can see there that we're, we're, you know, on top of maybe 100K of working memory, we're only using in the region of 50K of RAM. To, to achieve this, this particular screen and this user interface. Um, you can see there that this is potentially at the cost of maybe uh, extending the, the, the storage size. So uh, the flash gets comparatively larger. If you store images in compressed form, uh, they take up less space, but take buffers and SRAM to decompress them. So uh, it's a kind of a trade-off that we're, we're allowing you to make at the design stage rather than trying to you know, work this out later when you've pushed it to the board. So um, I, I hope that, that answers yeah, the point that you want to make, Jason. Yeah. Yeah. No, and we're not going to go too deep in this today because that next webinar we're talking about, we're actually going to go a little bit deeper dive into how you actually get a UI on the board. I just wanted to talk about because this is the big question we really do get, and we've been hearing this so much that we're like, well, let's just put the information in the tool so as people are making design choices, they see it immediately and they get immediate feedback on what that means. You know, if you're going to put all these background images that are graphic, you know, th there's a cost to everything. You know. You know, but at the same time, you don't want your UI just to be fills. So, um, yeah, Jason, I, I would add, um, yeah, this is one of the questions that we get, I would say, about 100% of the time. So, <laughs> having this feature is uh, really, really good and, and unique. Um, I think what it allows customers to do is at the beginning, you know, when they're architecting their device, because typically um, the product, you know, there's going to be follow ons. And I, I think having a tool like this really allows them to architect it better whether they're going to need, um, you know, external SRAM uh, down the road or more flash. And, and that's the unique part about the RT series is we have all these memory interfaces. And that was really the intent is to give developers a flexible platform, right? So traditionally on the MCU side, if you have embedded flash, you know, you're, you're stuck with that amount of flash that's on the device. And and if in, in some cases you can scale up, but to a certain degree, then you have to change your complete design to maybe deal with a different package and with the rt series that was really the intent is you know you can have an architecture of your product and then scale the memory up and down depending on what you need and i think having a tool like this allows uh developers to really think about that ahead of time no uh yeah. you know, we're pretty excited about this because yeah as you said this is uh when, especially when you get to parts like the rt where there's a I bound on the memory before you jump to another price point. Um, you know, yeah. people need to understand. And you know, there there is valid reasons to go to external RAM on side of there, uh, depending on the UI you're looking to do, the resolution. Um, you know, but you know, people are always looking. Well, could I get away with it? Well, with the speed that we develop our UIs, um, along with giving the information, you know, I think we can easily prototype something out and give you that exact information. Great. Um, I was going to do a sort of a jump while we're sort of talking about tools now and maybe come back to Brandon's world where as the ecosystem guy, um, you know, there, there's more than, uh, yeah, we like to think the UI is the whole tool suite and how you get a product to market, but there's a whole nother layer of ecosystem that has to happen down there um, as far as how a, how you take a product like the RT board and take it to market. So maybe, uh, maybe I could throw it to Brendan and he can, uh, Give us a little bit of an overview of uh, NXP and how they're helping their customers, uh, you know, take these market these products to market and what they're offering. Yeah, sure. Um, if I could maybe guarantee, just give me back the uh, the display ability there. I'll throw up a quick slide in a second that's going to show me how uh, help kind of frame that. But basically, we have a. Uh, um, a suite of tools and software to help enable our customers to get to the market quickly with the things that differentiate for them. Um, I'll just try and move my Google webinar thing out of the way here a little bit. Um, okay. Right. Okay, user error. Sorry, here we go. Um, and the intent here is to, like I said, enable the customers to differentiate. So um, under this MCU Expresso brand name, we have uh, a free IDE, which is based on uh, uh, GNU 
uh, compilers and debuggers and so on, but with a customized IDE. Uh, we also work with IR and Kyle as well to fully support their IDE, so it's not you're not locked into using this GNU based one if you don't want to. Um, we have configuration tools which help you go from our evaluation boards and um, then across to your own platform uh, once you've got your board design ready. But the key for this conversation really is about MCU Expresso SDK. And uh, you can um, download an SDK for your board. I'm, I just happen to have an RT1060 screenshot here. You, you go one-time registration, then you can go and configure your um, uh, SDK options that you want and download that. And then um, the 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 way that Crank have integrated with um, with the SDK is at this upper level of this uh, um, diagram here. I can just get a, a screen point to here. Okay. So we start from the hardware down here. Then we have um, our our support for our processor is based around ARM Simsys uh, standards. The RTOS here, so uh, Gary mentioned earlier that we include free RTOS examples in, in our software packages. You're not locked into free RTOS. You know, the, the code is written so that moving to another RTOS is definitely an option if you're already invested in something else. Um, then we have our peripheral driver. So this is where we do all the grunt work of figuring out all the register bit settings for you allowing stacks and middleware to sit on top of that. So this is notionally a board support. So our, our board support for our boards is here. The pin config tools help you map this across to your hardware. And really where the crank software sits is between, it's a, a, a piece of middle, middleware with the crank application kind of sitting on top of it um, to enable you to develop. And one of the things I really like about what the way that works is when you're trying to evaluate the um, uh, uh, the crank based designs, um, you're using the same application and you can, and the library's already sat here, so you can focus on uh, con developing that, what that UI looks like. Um, and you can easily move it across between, say, a 1060 and a 1050 or some other platform and, um, and then migrate to your own board afterwards. So you're you're getting the real benefit of the way this is all intended to work, which is is uh, not worrying about this lower level hardware that uh, you you don't want to spend your development time, your pressured hours working on. So that's how we're enabling the customers to get products out the door in under a year. So uh, so this is this is all uh, a quick overview of the uh, the SDK piece. It's all. All um, free software from from the NXP point of view because we're hardware guys, so we always have to give our software away for free, uh, of course. <laughs> and um, uh, but it, it should enable a customer get to the market quickly, and that's uh, really uh, what we're aiming for in everyone's best interest. Yeah, no, and that, that's great. So we're seeing you know our customers are getting there and they want to try the board right away and start evaluating it. You know. Whether they stick with the, R the free RTOS or they stick with the GNU tools or just want to switch, it, it doesn't matter too much to us, but we really work on getting a really tight integration with the MCU Expresso, just uh, SDK, to make sure that they can work. So maybe I'll let Gary talk a little bit about what that feels like from a storyboard customer's point of view um, when they start there. Oh, thanks, yeah. And, um, it's actually really quite straightforward. So we, we took... Um, as a baseline, we took the the SDK uh, as you download it from uh, NXP, and um, we've we've written a an SDK for for our stuff, which sits alongside it. So it sits on top of all the drivers that uh, that um, Brenda was mentioning. Um, we you know basically it's uh, it's 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 easy for us to sit alongside um, other software you may already have. Um, so we're adding things like a touch interface uh, with a touch screen driver uh, and LCD IO and LCD driver interfaces, which may be are an extension of what was there already. So um, we, for example, our, our baseline SDK is, is designed to to run um, as a as a, an add-on to the Hello World free Otos example that comes in the SDK standard. But there's a simple set of step-by-step. Uh, -step, um, processes there to add and weave our, our code and our calls and our libraries, um, which are static libraries we, we distribute. Um, 
and those those basically are, are easy easy to integrate and uh, and it should in an afternoon should allow you to uh, to take take your existing code and run our code on top of it and provide a UI. So uh, we in the past have um, have developed uh, binary evaluation images which are fairly limited functionality, but um, you know they're they're just binary. You can't do anything with it. It's far more impressive and far easier for somebody to get an appreciation of how how a real product development would go if, if they can actually use their code and build it in. Um, and that's what we've actually been doing in the, um, in the NXP um, tech days, the, the sessions we've been doing in, um, in Chicago and Minneapolis. Uh, people have actually been doing this for, for real, with real code live uh, in a couple of hours. So it really is that, that easy. Yeah, I know that's been, a, for us, we've been, um, as uh, Gary said, at the NXP tech days, and there's a lot more coming around North America. Um, and I, I'll put out some of the, the dates and stuff for other cities. But in a two-hour class, we're having them start with a Photoshop file, bring it into Storyboard, create the uh, couple of screens, create some animations, you know, test out some ideas, and use the MCU Expresso tools to push it down onto a board live in the class where they can actually see it um, right away. So, uh, you know, the feedback from that's been great so far. And, you know, I think once they understand how this whole offering comes together to really increase that pace. You know, if you can see that much that fast, think about how that just pushes your time to market. You can put stuff in front of people's uh, eyes immediately to start getting feedback and understanding what's that going to be real when you start building building your product. So, no, that was great. Um, Jason, I wanted to ask you something about that because as from our side, we're the hardware oriented people mainly. And when you get the customers coming in saying, wow, this looks, I want a UI like this, I've got no idea how I'm going to do that. You touched about Photoshop there and how that works in the few minutes we have. Can you comment on how, how customers who aren't graphics experts are handling these problems and, and how Crank can help them do that? Yeah, so we are a little bit different than your standard tools by that. We're not like a C, C++ widget framework. We stepped back and said, you know, these designs are coming from designers. Um, so we looked at how does that come. So we, we not only support Photoshop import, we can import from other tools like Sketch, 3D Max, uh, when you have a GPU. Um, you can bring in just your PNGs and everything and drag and drop them out the screen. Um, if you don't have those sets, we do have this idea of components where you can get some basic default pieces, but we also offer graphical services too to help people build that if they don't have that sort of uh, tool set under them. But we, we believe that the best products are when design and engineering come together. So we are putting a little bit of an expectation that, yeah, somewhere somebody is building a, a design intent for your product and you're not just dragging out, you know, 100 uh, widgets onto a screen and using whatever the default look is. You know, the days where everybody tried to look like a Microsoft dialog box is gone. Um, everybody wants a unique and custom uh, look. So, um, yeah, no, that, that's exactly what we help with and how, how we work. So it's a, uh, if you didn't have that, just reach out to us and talk and we can either point you to companies who can help out. But as I said, we also do design work there. So um, and we have a lot of samples. So even if you don't have a design yet, um, when you look at our demo image pages, and I'll, show, I'll send a link at this uh, in a minute, um, you can see we have dishwasher, I mean, uh, washing machine samples, coffee machine samples on all different boards across the NXP uh, portfolio. So it give you a really quick and fast uh, idea of a, a bunch of UIs and give you a performance idea of what this board can do right out of the box. And you know, just by downloading an SD card and putting it in this, uh, into the system. So. Um, well, we're getting at uh, 10 minutes too, and we wanted to uh, handle some questions now. So maybe I'll just get the screen control back here. And uh, oh, there we go. Am I on? Okay, so we've got a couple of questions that have come in through the Q and A. Um, but if you have any more that you want to quickly post in there, do that. So I'm just going to direct it to whomever I think is. <coughs> but step in, if somebody, if, if it's better suited to you. So uh, there's a couple of technical questions here, and then we can get to storyboard. So firstly, can we use DMA for frame buffer memory? Uh, I guess I'll take that one. Um, I kind of had another slide we didn't get to. Um, so maybe if I show you that one. Um, you guys seen that? Yep. Um, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess it's on, 
underlying is uh, is performance. Uh, so the answer is yes, um, and that's where basically the PXP comes in. Um, so the PXP is a is a pixel pipeline accelerator um, that allows you to move the pixels around on the hardware control rather than in software. So so kind of a, an augmented DMA, um, you know, uh, added together with uh, LCD synchronization and other interesting uh, and useful features like. Uh, Screen rotation, for example, so you can rotate uh, rotate screens, uh, and that back to the uh, back to the cost and the bill of materials things. Uh, it's pretty difficult to find native um, portrait mode displays. Uh, we get a lot of customers wanting to use a portrait mode of or portrait style of presentation, uh, and they can't find LCD panels in portrait capability. So they design in portrait, uh, and we rotate it for a landscape display at runtime. So. And that's much faster than the PXP. So uh, I guess, yes, uh, um, indeed, under the covers, we sit on top of the standard NXP driver set. Um, you know, the uh, the LCD stuff uses um, uses DMA or whatever else it, it uses under the cover. And that's that's supported by the NXP drivers themselves. We don't play a part there. So we typically just provide a, a frame buffer that gets displayed. Um, and um, one, note, one thing I did want to mention as well is uh, back on the memory side of things. Uh, we did some experimentation um, and uh, looking at where you put the memory uh, for the frame buffer is, is a key performance um, factor. So it's the access speed. If you think what we're doing, we're, we're doing lots of read write operations for rendering. Um, the faster you can do that physically, just accessing a, a given byte or a bit in a byte uh, is, is, uh, is directly a relationship of performance. So uh, Actually, putting on the on-chip uh, DTCM memory, uh, if you can, uh, is a is 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 a is a really useful free performance increase. So, just using the flex RAM to uh, reconfigure that and repartition the memory uh, is awesome. is all. Good. So, uh, yeah, there's a link at the top there, AAN twelve oh seventy seven. So, uh, take a look at that. that you a lot of <laughs> okay. Okay. So thank you, Gary. So does Storyboard provide a pure C API to the embedded runtime, or do you also provide a C++ API? Um, so I can take this one here. Uh, we have a new version of Storyboard that's coming out. So by our history, we were mainly on MPUs before. Um, with the, we didn't spend too much time focusing on MCUs. There was no nothing blocking us from there, other than the complexity and the quality of the UI that we were focusing on building with our product. Um, this shift to these more powerful MCUs and what people are doing down there now has really changed it. So now we are putting a lot of effort down there. So now we have multiple options on how you integrate to your code with us. We have a messaging API. We have a Lua uh, engine that you can use, which is a scripting engine um, if you have enough memory. When people start going into these smaller spots, it's a direct C, C++ callback. They would be calling for their, uh, for their uh, UI uh, work when they're actually going to do their real system engineering work. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, does Crank Storyboard support video play on the RT? Um, there, I'm trying to remember on that one. We can always do video um, one way or another. Um, if there isn't a codec or something on the hardware that increases the speed and performance of that. So maybe Mario might know that. Yeah, we will. We can do it, but we'll be bound by software performance. So then it gets into your resolution and such. So th there's always a way to do it with just software. Um, on hardware boards that have that, um, we can do it, or we can do it through other things sometimes with like uh, uh, GIFs or other things, depending on the video you want to show. Excellent. Okay, so there's a couple of questions here about Storyboard Lite, um, specifically about the differences between it and the full version limitations, and also some uh, insight into the pricing and licensing model. Well, I can let Gary talk about some of the differences between Storyboard and Storyboard Lite from the technical standpoint. Sure. Yeah. Um, um, the essentially Storyboard Lite is a is a filter. It's a it's a it's so a feature reduced version of the full storyboard. So in terms of development and design phase, everything's all exactly the same. Um, with maybe a few things that don't make sense when you're looking at a, an MCU platform. Um, 3D rotation, for example, um, that's that really requires 3D uh, 3D hardware. So what we've done, we've we've taken uh, taken the, the whole insides of storyboard. We've looked at how we're using memory. We've we've optimized it. We've we've uh, 
got lots of re-strategy in there. And we've lowered the benchmark to something like 100 k KB of uh, working memory. And then above that, you've got the frame buffer and various other things. So um, Storyboard Lite is, is exploiting that um, by, by allowing you to really fine tune and uh, where you have these, these smaller memories and more constrained resources, pick and choose the plugins and the actual components of, uh, of Storyboard that you're going to be using in your application. So we've made it much more modular and um, we're able to reduce the size uh, just down to what you need. And that's that's really what Storyboard Lite is. It's a, it's a it's a, a collection or a packaging of, of storyboard in in, in, a, in a way that fits smaller application platforms. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the pricing and stuff, you know, as uh, we don't publish our pricing, but we do like we do have multiple options. We are a very accommodating company as far as how people deal with these things. So we we do sometimes per unit uh, pricing. Sometimes we do single purchase points and licensing, um, you know, usually pretty much anybody, we can find a way to work with them and show them. Our product uh, storyboard is identical to what you've always seen before. So we did a, when we did storyboard light, it was a, we did not want to build a new product. We wanted to give, and it's especially for customers who have that product line and they can actually live, a, use one product for developing their UI across everything. So even all the way up to your IMX8 uh, with, you know, multiple cores and multiple GPUs, um, you know, we're running on there and then they can scale all the way down with a single product uh, development process. Okay. Um, are we to working fully today with the RT series MCU? Is storyboard light? Uh, yeah, no, we are already on the 1050, the 1060, and we're working con very closely with NXP on their roadmap. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. And we've also got that webinar coming up. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we can, uh, I think yeah, we have a that. link to that at the end and it'll probably in a follow-up email. So. Yeah. Um, there's some, some more questions about event buffering here. Does Storyboard event buffer have any mem memory limitation and will there be, be any event dropping if there are many events coming from the back end? Well, uh, I'll take that one, Jason. It's, uh, we, we, <laughs> Well, maybe I'll let you take it. No, no, I'm not joking. Um, so uh, it, it, essentially, we use message queues um, on FreeAutos, for example. We use um, we use the FreeAutos message queue. Uh, it's, a, it's a it's a system object part of the Autos on Linux, for example. We use uh, Sys, SysV message queues. Um, so these are pretty fundamental, um, you know, hardcore constructs of the OS. And we use queues uh, and readers and writers. So you put it in a queue. At one end and read the event out the other. So, um, if the underlying mechanisms have uh, have got any constraints, it's outside of storyboard. So we just use the system uh, resources. So uh, uh, we've not come across any so far. Okay. Um, Alicia, I, I do want to make a comment about the previous question. So there was a question about support of the RT devices and. Um, yes, the, the crank uh, storyboard is supported on those, but I do want to say state that. Uh, you know, the Crank team is uh, an early access partner on a lot of our products. So we've been working with them with i.mx for many years. Um, we have some future products coming on, even on the RT series where we even push the performance even further up into the, the apps processor type level of uh, performance. And uh, you'll see that the Crank team will be one of our early access partners. And when we go to market, um, we'll have support for those devices as well. Excellent. Uh, okay, I think that's pretty much all of the questions, which is excellent timing because it's 12 o'clock. So thank you. Any more comments from anybody here before we close it up? We're good. Okay, so thank you everybody. If you do have any more um, questions, feel free to uh, send us an email to um, uh, marketing at cranksoftware.com. We're going to be following up with an email with a link to uh, the next webinar that's coming up. So I've just, uh, are you still sharing, Jason? No. Um, I don't think so. Let's get back to you. So it's the next webinar that is coming up on May 23rd, where we will be uh, giving some insight into the uh, storyboard light that's coming up and the RT. Um, uh, 1060 from NXP. So yeah, please give it in, uh, a look in your inbox for that. And finally, uh, we do have a free trial available on our website. Oh, it's not working. Okay. 
we there do we have go. a free trial available on our website if you go to forward slash free free dash trial um, but also if you currently have an XP um, uh, platform make sure you go to crank software forward slash NXP and you will see all of the demo images that we have already created to support NXP uh, they're available for download so you can actually see it running on your device so that's it. Thank you very much, everybody, for your time. And uh, thank you to all of our presenters today, Brendan and Mario. Thank you so much for doing this with us. And ho hopefully we'll do it again. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Jason, Gary, yeah. pleasure as always. Thank you. Oh, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.